Can you guess the most dreaded question on a job interview? Most people would say the most difficult question to answer is what's your greatest weakness? And how do you do that? How do you answer that question? You don't want to tell them the truth because if you do, you're probably not going to get the job. But you have to say something, so what do you say? One approach is to disguise your weakness as strength. So you might say something like, I'm such a perfectionist that I sometimes expect too much of myself and other people. You know, it's a weakness, but not really. Or you might say, well, I work so hard that sometimes my life can be a little out of balance. And so you take something that's actually a strength and you make it sound like a weakness. But the whole idea is that you find a way around the question because whatever you do, you don't want to be honest about a weakness. And that mentality is drilled into us. I mean, we live in a culture that celebrates strength and has very little tolerance for weakness. But here's how great grace is. Grace gives us the freedom to not only admit weakness, but to celebrate it. When we celebrate our weakness, it actually opens the floodgates for grace to pour into our lives. The Apostle Paul talks about this in one of his letters to the church in the city of Corinth. Corinth was a city that celebrated strength. It was known for its luxurious lifestyles, its impressive architecture. Even today, the Corinthian style of architecture is characterized by, you know, the massive columns and amazing detail. It's all meant to portray self-sufficiency and power. And Paul could have really gotten into that power game with the Corinthians. I mean, he was from the right family and he had the right resume. But instead, Paul wanted the Christians to understand that it's in his weakness that he has discovered the greatness of God's grace. And so Paul describes a weakness that he has. He describes it as a thorn in the flesh. Three different times he says, I beg the Lord to take it away from me. What was Paul's thorn in the flesh? We're not sure. Bible scholars have suggested many possibilities, but no one really knows. I can't help but wonder if Paul was intentionally vague in order to make it a little easier for us to fill in the blank with our own weakness. What would yours be? I mean, what have you begged God to change, to heal? What have you begged God to take away? The Lord spoke to me and said, you're gonna marry Matt Davidson. I hadn't, I hadn't been talking to Matt Davidson. I hadn't seen him in a while. Ended up starting to date in August, engaged in October, married the next June of 1999. He was just a good, good husband, just always encouraging. Not perfect, but perfect for me. He was more of an extrovert, I'm more of an introvert. He um, just had a passion and a love for people. He asked the Lord for that specifically and led my children and I daily on just loving people. If we were at a restaurant, there wasn't a server who he didn't say, you know, so are you into are you into Jesus? Do you know him? You know, and praying for people in the produce department of the grocery store when I'm just there to get the list done. I got a phone call from a number I didn't recognize. I heard a man say, I'm with Matt. He said he's he's been in an accident, but he's okay, he wanted me to call you. I just gathered the kids, put them in the car. The EMS lady said, you know, he's going to be okay. I think he's just got a, like, a broken hip. He had a tear in his arm and some glass and blood in his hair. They were going to just do surgery um, on his hip and that that would probably be done in the next day or two. So he had the surgery and they called me in after the surgery and said it just couldn't have gone better. They were going to have him up moving around the next day. We just kind of hung out in the room, which was so nice, and talked and laughed. And he, Matt was reading his text that he had been getting over the last few days. And I remember in the middle of the night, I was trying to sleep and a nurse came in to check his vitals and I heard him say, so do you know Jesus at all? Do you? I was like, oh, <laughs> of course, okay. So I'd gone in the bathroom to brush my teeth and just kind of get ready and I heard him say, um, something's not right. He said, something, something's happening with my heart. It feels like the top of my head's getting ready to come off. Pillows started flying and people started running in and my brain just wasn't processing. So I went out in the hall just because there was no room. I just started praying. I was just didn't even know what to pray. I didn't didn't know what was happening, but I was just kind of crying out. And then the next thing I knew, the nurse came out to the door and she just had this sweetest calm look on her face and she said, "You can see him now." And I said, "Oh good, is he, you know, is he stable?" And and she said, "He didn't make it." Everything just 
went dark around me. It was kind of like everything was just a blur. I went in the room and laid my head on his chest and just mourned and grieved and cried. And I remember just saying, I can't, I can't, I can't. And I can't tell my children that their dad isn't here anymore. And I can't raise them as a single mom. Every time I looked around, there was more people in the room that I knew, and that was so odd to me. I just can't, I could not imagine ever going into a room with a person who had just passed away in there. And so um, I went into the chapel, and my boys, my little girl, she was two and a half. I told them, I said, um, I said, you know that song we love? All I know is I'm not home yet. This is not where I belong. Take this world and give me Jesus. This is not where I belong. And I said, Daddy's home now. And my older son, he had been 11 for one week, exactly. And he just said, Daddy died. And just one tear came down. My youngest son at that time, five and a half. So I don't want Daddy to be dead. And I said, you know, he's more alive now than he was here. We just can't see him. I came down the stairs. Um, I looked around and the whole lobby of the hospital was just filled. I want to say hundreds of people um, were just there. They were just standing in the lobby just to be there. And um, once again, I just thought, you know, who does that? I just remember just hearing the Lord in my mind just real calming and saying, you can't, but I can. If you cling to me, we're going we're gonna to get through this. I think there was at least two, if not more, baptisms after the funeral. I was told that there were some nurses that were there the day he died that um, had made decisions for Christ. And I just thought, okay, I can make it every day if I keep hearing, you know, that, that this is what's going Because Matt would have said all day long, you know, if my death brings people to Jesus, you know, he would, he would do that. Matt was my rock. He's who I bounced pretty much every decision off of. It's so amazing how the Lord just comes in and fills that gap. Once Matt died, there was just a sense of urgency. It almost made me mad, you know, that I'd ever spent any time caring about anything other than people's salvation. So many of the little things in my life over the last almost five years feel like they've been stunted. Being a, a homemaker and the best mom I could be, all those little things that are important, you know, but yet my relationship with the Lord and who He is has been propelled so far past whatever I would have thought, you know. There's so much more to Him that I've found and have ta been able to teach my kids, you know. Ask Him for this. He wants to give you good things and just been able to trust Him more. And I tell them, especially my older ones, you know, you have an understanding that most people don't have and, you know, to whom much is given, much is expected. We're coming up on five years now and I wake up excited every day to see what I'm going to experience with, with Jesus. My definition of grace is the power that I don't have that can only come from Him. The fact that I'm more in love with Jesus than I've ever been, that I really knew was possible. Um, and that my kids have a different perspective of who he is is huge and it's a gift that I don't take lightly. That's a gift that I, I wouldn't have had because I relied on Matt for adventure, you know? <laughs> he is who he says he is and, and that is good and that is love. That's all we've experienced from him. So, what is your weakness? What is the thorn in your flesh that you've pleaded with God to take away? We aren't exactly sure what word Paul would use to fill in that blank for his weakness, but he makes it clear that God's grace is always enough. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, 9 through 10, that each time he prayed for God to take his weakness away, God responded by saying, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now Paul says, I'm glad to boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why he says, I take pleasure in my weakness and in the insults and the hardships and the persecutions and the troubles and that I can suffer for Christ. He writes, for when I am weak, then I am strong. 
the strength of God was only able to be perfected in the midst of weakness. And so Paul became more and more excited about his weakness than his power because in his weakness there was room for God to show up and show off. And acknowledging weakness then invites God's presence and power into our lives. When we are weak, God's grace is greater. So would you do something for me as we finish this up? I want you to imagine that in your hand is a single cup. It's empty. And let's just say that this emptiness represents your weakness. And someone directs you to a nearby hose. The water comes trickling out of the hose into the cup and you're hoping there's at least enough to fill up your cup. And the water goes right up to the edge and then stops. And time passes and you come back. You come back to the hose, but this time you've traded in your cup for an empty bucket. And let's make this bucket a symbol of having a bit of a health scare or maybe some financial issues. And so you turn on the hose and the water comes again. Gradually, that bucket fills all the way to the top, but when it reaches the rim, it stops flowing. Time passes and this time you come with a large wheelbarrow full of emptiness and you bring it to that same old hose. Maybe you've lost your job and with it your confidence. Or maybe your marriage is in a bad place. It's worse than you realized. Maybe it's a special needs child and you're just overwhelmed. And so you turn on the hose. Plumbing still works. The water comes out and the wheelbarrow begins to fill. The next time you pull up with a huge trailer behind a semi truck, this time it's big. Radiation treatments, child is in prison, an affair, an unexpected and untimely death of someone you dearly loved, and you turn on the hose. Water begins to flow into that tank, and you're sure there won't be enough, but it just keeps coming for hours and hours and hours. It flows right up to the edge of the tank until it won't take another drop, and then the water turns off. See, this is how the grace of God works. There is always enough. And however much emptiness you bring to him, that's how much grace he's going to give you. The emptier we are, the more of his grace we can receive. The weaker we are, the greater we discover God's grace to be.